Romans chapter 8, verses 5 and 6, we've been considering the duty and responsibility of spiritual mindedness, and we've been looking at a number of related responsibilities. The one we are presently considering is the cultivation of spiritual mindedness. So let's read Romans 8, verses 5 and 6, which is our text. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And so there are three things related to the cultivation, the development, the deepening of a habit and practice of spiritual mindedness that we are looking at. The first the advantages of cultivating spiritual thoughts, and secondly, essential guidelines and cautions, and then third, how to think spiritually about Christ. We will look at uh, the second one today, which we started last time, and cover several more essential guidelines and cautions concerning the need to be spiritually minded, and then we will begin our look at how to think spiritually about Christ. And Lord willing, in our next message, on Romans 8, 5, and 6, we'll be finished with this particular aspect of <clears throat> sanctification, which Romans 8 addresses in general, which is the grace and duty of being spiritually minded. And again, I want to remind you that Christianity gets down into the very thoughts, into the very motives, the very mind of the Christian. Christianity pervades every single aspect of our inner man. Christianity begins in our innermost spiritual being, our spiritual man. And whenever we lose the practice of our wonderful faith given to us by our Lord Jesus Christ, from the center, the core, the innermost being moving outward, whenever we lose Christ as central, as applied to the innermost being, um, what, what we have left is really ritualism. Christian ritualism. And so to summarize the essential guidelines, which is point do, two under cultivation of spiritual thoughts, in the first pl place we saw the essential guideline that our thoughts about heaven must be accurate and based soundly on scripture. Uh, the thoughts that we do think are very, very important and God doesn't just accept any old mystical or religious kind of thinking. If we are thinking God's thoughts after him, they have to be in harmony with the scripture uh, for him to accept those thoughts. Secondly, we cannot be too spiritually minded. We cannot be too spiritually minded. Thirdly, we should think often about heaven and what it means to us. We're going to a glorious place, brothers and sisters, called heaven. And there's very little of the reality of heaven that we can conceive of here in this world. As the Bible says, we look through a glass darkly. But it's a place that is described throughout the scriptures that is so incomprehensible and deep and wide in its glory, in its beauty, in its bliss, in its joy, that we will, we will be given new bodies, new glorified bodies and minds to be able to adapt to this new place called heaven where there will be no more corruptible and, no, uh, and uh, no more sin. Well, let's move to the fourth guideline, the essential guideline and caution concerning spiritual mindedness, which is <clears throat> we should contrast the great truths of heaven with the frightening facts of hell. Heaven becomes a wonderful, beautiful place as many things we are taught in the Bible, when it's contrasted, contrasted to its opposite. And some people say that there's no such thing as hell. Others imagine all kinds of fantasies of what hell is like or would be like, like a place where sin will be enjoyed to the fullest measure by those who occupy hell. They think it's a place where Satan is in control and he kind of is like a bad CEO directing all the activities of this terrible place. 
Others say that hell is here on earth because they've had a lot of bad experiences. And even within the church, there's been a rash of theologians in recent years who have exchanged a belief in the existence of hell for a teaching called annihilationism. This is a state where the soul and spirit ceases to exist after death. So they say, and so they teach. The Bible knows nothing of that at all, annihilationism. We were given souls, and those souls will live forever. Every human being who has ever lived, who has ever been created, will live forever. We are immortal in our souls. And the Bible defines two places that all of these eternal souls will live, either in heaven or in hell. But many people just don't like to think about hell because of its implications that are just so unthinkable to them. I don't think any one of us in this place can really endure meditating and thinking about hell and the lake of fire for any extended length of time without the grace of God helping us recover from, from such a, a frightening and, and a terrible uh, thing to think about. But for true Christians, the more we think about the punishment and misery of the wicked in the lake of fire and brimstone, the more we'll be able to thank and praise God for the salvation he has given to us from sin. Salvation from sin and the consequences of sin. Hell and the lake of fire. Remember, hell is only a temporary place. Death and hell will both be cast into the permanent place of punishment called the lake of fire and brimstone. And so when we think about hell, our thoughts, our reaction emotionally and spiritually often is with anxiety and restlessness, maybe fear, maybe godly fear. And, and instinctively we we reach out for something positive to think about. Of course, you, you can't get anything more positive than heaven except the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the triune God himself. But the more we think about hell and the lake of fire, the more we'll be moved to thank God for this so great salvation and praise him for the unspeakable glory we will enjoy in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ forever. We will say, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, O oh death, where is your sting? O oh Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. For the Christian, when we think about hell and the lake of fire and all those terrible things connected with it, we immediately are reminded that that is not our destiny. That is not our plight. That is not where we're going. We're going to heaven because our Lord Jesus Christ purchased for us through his death on the cross the victory over death and hell and all of the enemies of God and his people. As Paul again, give thanks, uh, he gives thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Colossians 1, 12 through 14. Paul continues to give thanks to God for his indescribable gift. And that gift is salvation. That gift is heaven. That gift is eternal glory to live with God and in heaven forever. And so when we think about hell, and certainly the fear of God is stirred up when we meditate on that terrible place, it draws our minds back to the Lord and to our destiny as Christians, which is to be with the Lord in heaven. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, an unhealthy thing to think about hell. As a matter of fact, many of you or some of you, and I know of many others who have been drawn into salvation, effectually called there by the initial thought of the fear of hell, which is not a bad thing. 
The Bible says, therefore, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But again, for those who are saints, hell and anything bad and negative always leads us to the purchased possession, the inheritance that our Lord died on the cross to give us, which is heaven forever. When we remember that Christ has delivered us from hell, it will prompt us to praise him for what we don't deserve, which is heaven. It will, it will prompt praise. The, the next guideline, the fifth guideline on meditating on spiritual things, is don't let weakness or being tired prevent you from meditating on spiritual things. Weakness, physical, emotional, and spiritual tiredness often is a gateway to ultimately tearing down layers of, of spiritual thoughts that have been laid up, that have taken a lot of work and a lot of grace to lay up within our hearts and our minds. Are you hearing what I'm saying? In, I want you to turn with me to 1 Peter 1.13. 1 Peter 1.13. We're talking about our minds. Who has control of our minds? Because it is through our minds that we think God's thoughts after Him. It is through our minds that we worship and present acceptable sacrifices to the Lord in adoration and praise. Therefore, our minds are very important to God. The purity of our minds are of vital concern to God, His work, His kingdom, and to our effective service to the Lord. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is very important. This is critical. If you're to serve God and out to serve God effectively. 1 Peter 1.13 Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. There are two words in here that are very important which speak volumes about the grace and duty of cultivating spiritual mindedness. The first word is gird up which is one word in the Greek. The second word is the word loins. Let's talk for just a minute or two about those two words. Gird up is a verb meaning bind up and is typically used to describe gir the girding up of the long oriental robes that they wore in this day for walking or uh, working. They had, to, they had to pull them up, gird them up so they can stretch the legs out more for walking or for working. In other words, gird up then, as applied to this text, is a metaphor or a way of saying, prepare your minds for action. Just like they, they had to lift up those robes a little bit to prepare for work or for walking, God uses the same word, gird up your mind. Prepare your mind for work, for action. The word loins is a word meaning hips or waist. In the New Testament, there's only a half dozen times where this word is used, but it is a significant word, especially for our purposes here, in the duty of, of cultivating spiritual thoughts and godly meditation. And it, it, it's a significant word because it, the, the word loins means the center, it, it, the word loins is a metaphor for the center of power and strength, especially for a man. The waist, the hips, the loins area is the center of his strength, both, both physically and, and otherwise. And God uses it as a metaphor for the center of spiritual strength here. Gird up the loins of your mind. Your mind, so we use the word loins or your waist, which is a center of strength for a man especially, applies it to the mind. He says, look, gird up the center of your strength. Don't let it grow weak. If it grows weak, especially with regard to your th thoughts, gird it up, get it strengthened again. Don't let your, your thought life, your mind, be vulnerable and susceptible to, to being in a permanent state of weakness. Why? Because our mind is really the environment in which the battle takes place for our souls and the souls of others. Let me, let me emphasize the importance of this word loins or waste as the center of our spiritual strength. When Jesus, uh, Jesus used this very term in Luke 12, turn to Luke 12. He used this word 
loins and girded. Luke 12, read with me verses 35 through 37. Luke 12, 35 through 37. He says, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. So when Jesus says, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, he's actually using two metaphors to talk about the importance of being ready for his second coming. The first metaphor is your waist being girded, and the second one is your lamps burning. And so what is he doing? He's warning us to be ready for his second coming. But he uses the metaphor of your waist being, of course, a metaphor of the center of your strength, your, your strength, your, uh, your waist, your spiritual life, your spiritual mind being girded, being prepared, being ready. And, and so uh, the apostle uses the same language, for example, in Ephesians 6.14, the apostle Paul, turn to Ephesians 6.14. Ephesians 6.14. These are three of the six passages in the New Testament I'm sharing with you that use the word loins and girded because they are directly being applied to the spiritual preparedness that we need to have in our thinking as it relates to our responsibility to be spiritually minded. Are you following me? Okay, in Ephesians 6.14, we read, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. See, those two words are used again. The waist, or the loins, and girded. And he's saying, look, as we fight the good fight of faith, by, we fight the good fight of faith by preparing and covering our innermost being, our spiritual minds, with truth. Our strength is in the Lord, our spiritual waist, our loins, the center of our spiritual strength is protected by the truth. When we're commanded to having girded your waist with truth, we're to, we're to protect our, our spiritual mindedness and the strength that issues from that to be able to meditate on the Lord by, by being covered, by covering our minds with the truth, assimilating the truth in large quantities. And, and if I might carry this, this application from Jesus to Paul, uh, the same is true with spiritual mindedness and meditation. When our minds grow weak and tired, listen, we are especially vulnerable to suggestions and attack. And we are therefore commanded in 1 Peter 1.13, gird up the loins of your mind. That is, don't give in to the weakness of the mind. Don't let your weak mental state just, just remain unprotected and open to the attack of the enemy. Fight against it. Be zealous and jealous to guard your mind. You think Satan's not going to take advantage of such a, an unguarded mental and spiritual state? The Bible commands, do not let the devil take advantage over you. And therefore, don't give, give way to suggestions and temptations of the enemy to be mentally lazy because you're tired. Well, you know, I came home from work and I'm tired. Or I did, I did this chore and I'm tired. And your mind is being bombarded with all kinds of thoughts and you say, you know, I'm just tired. And you just plop yourself down in front of something that, that just deepens your uh, distractions all the more and subjects your mind all the more to spiritual poison. But don't give way to these temptations to be mentally lazy because in the end, uh, because we will, we will end up doing greater damage to our minds in the end. When it's hard to concentrate and focus your thoughts on meditating on the Lord, being spiritually minded, don't stop trying. Don't surrender. Don't give in. 
Return to holy meditation again and again throughout the day. If you're at work, wherever you are, and the enemy is taking advantage of that, of, of that situation, because you have to occupy your mind with other things besides the things of the Lord at work and at such times, don't give up. Come back throughout the day to those thoughts of God and of Christ and of the Word. Groan within yourself as the scripture depicts this conflict and this battle for the mind. It, it, it manifests this, this, this conflict between the flesh and the spirit. And very often we groan spiritually in the midst of this fiery battle. As Romans 8, if you're in Romans 8, you should, uh, let's turn back there to Romans 8, verses 23 through 26. Give us a hint of this. Romans 8, verse 23. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves, greatly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. In other words, the battle causes us to groan. Being in this world causes us to groan. The battle for our thoughts causes longing and agony in our souls. But we are to come back again and again throughout the day, even though we may be losing some of the battles, come back to Christ, His promises, His Word, who He is as our Redeemer, our Mediator, our Shepherd, our Sanctifier, and begin thinking about Him again. Begin thinking about His promises, meditating on them, looking to Him. Even exercising the smallest faith will cause the blessing of enlargement of soul, will cause the seed of small meditation on the things of God to grow and expand by the grace and power of the Holy Spirit. Because however weak you may be, you are groaning heavenwards. You are casting yourselves on the Lord. You're forcing your mind to come back to the things of Christ, to the truths of Christ, to the word of Christ. You're, you're acknowledging by your weakness and your inability that you're looking unto Jesus to come and help you. And the Bible says in verse 26 of Romans 8, Likewise, this Spirit also helps in our strength. Is that what it says? No, in our weaknesses. The Spirit helps in our weaknesses. So therefore, <coughs> when you lose a battle in meditating on the things of God during your responsibility throughout the day to yield up your mind unto holy spiritual mindedness. Come back to the Lord in your weakness and say, Lord, quicken me, strengthen me. Pour forth fresh thoughts of Christ and of heaven into my mind. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, another important passage with regard to not surrendering your minds to weak, a weakened state without coming back and picking up where you left off to regain any kind of spiritual territory that's been lost. In 2 Corinthians 10, and in verse 3 through 5, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Now there's this constant effort of the enemy to erect strongholds in our minds. In our minds, strongholds of worldly thinking, sin, vanity, futility, wickedness, even legitimate things erected that would sidetrack us from constantly dwelling upon the things of the Lord. And these buildings of these strongholds are constantly uh, being erected by the enemy off and on throughout the day. And God says... Uh, what God, God teaches us what we're to do with these strongholds under construction. He says in verse 5, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. In other words, in your thinking, in your thinking, as these thoughts of the world and sin gain momentum and power and strength, you are to be the CEO 
of a Christian salvage company that brings in this huge crane with this big steel ball of God. And you're to destroy and to crush and to smash those strongholds that are being erected in your thoughts, in your mind, in your imagination, which appeal to your vanity, which appeal to your selfishness, which appeal to our self-centeredness, which appeals to our pride, which appeals to our besetting sins, which appeals to the seeds of sensuality within us. And God says... We are to cast down those arguments and every, not some, not a few, not one or two, but every single high thing. That is the thought that's thrown against you in your mind, in your mind. It's a high thing. It's something bold enough and brazen enough to reach God and challenge the thought and truth of God. That something that would substitute the doctrines of God, the truth of God in your mind and heart. It's a high thing that exalts itself against what? The knowledge of God. It's challenging your knowledge of God, your convictions on the truth, the images of God and of Christ, not literal pictures, but, but the truths that Christ has established and etched in your spiritual mind and being. And you're to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. This passage, especially in verse 5, is a beautiful description of the battle for our minds. God gives us specific responsibilities and things we have to do. He tells us every thought that comes in. We're to be so spiritually in tune with the Lord. Our discernment and insight into things spiritual are to be working at such a high level We've hidden truth in the inward parts so deeply that every thought coming in, we're able to sense and discern whether it's from God or not. And if it's not from God, we're to take that rebellious thought into captivity. We're to make it a slave of the obedience of Christ. That's what we're to do with our minds. We cannot lazily set aside the responsibility. No matter how weak we may be, physically or otherwise, of keeping our minds and our thought life pure for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a scary thing to have to say, okay, here I am. I just worked eight hours. And I've got all these other things to do when I get home in my other world. Now, that's going to take an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. It's going to require physical strength. Mental exertion, emotional, I've got to communicate with my wife or I've got to spend time with my children. Are you telling me that throughout the day during my job and when I get home and I spend time with my family and everything else I do, I'm going to be fighting an ongoing battle, a running battle in my thought life? Yes! Yes. That's why heaven is our rest. Because in this world we wear many hats and we're working many jobs both spiritually and physically at the same time. And by the time we die, we should be somewhat spiritually exhausted and ready for our eternal rest in heaven. I've known some believers who have looked older than their years reflect because they've been journeyman soldiers fighting the good fight of faith for so long that they, their bodies have, have paid the price. And uh, it's taken its toll on them. You look at their brothers and sisters, and their siblings look much younger than them. Number six. Don't lose the progress you've made in meditation. If you do work hard to recover it. When you meditate day in and day out, spending hours, if you're able to, throughout the day, to think about Christ, to have your thoughts occupied like a filter, having the Word of God going through your mind, having listening to sermons, and use your time wisely. You're driving from point A to point B. Some of us are on the road an hour to two hours a day. 
We don't even have an hour to read and pray, but we're on the road for an hour or two, driving during the day. Use that time wisely. Don't just turn on the radio and listen to anything and bounce from radio station to radio station. You do that for a half hour. You'll fill, you can fill your mind with the music of the world, the philosophical and ideological secular blasphemies of the world. And by the time you get home, you got your, your head is filled of, with all kinds of sensuality and philosophies of the world. And that is that has stripped away all the, the the three or four layers of truth and love for Christ that that you uh, laid up from morning until then by doing it the right way. Maybe listening to Bible reading tapes or CDs or sermons on your way to work. You say, well, I don't have a CD player in my car. All I have is a cassette player and cassettes are pretty much obsolete now. Well, I would say that it would be a very good investment to, have, to buy a CD player and exchange it for that obsolete cassette player. And you just think, for an hour to two hours a day, you could fill your mind <coughs> with the reading of scriptures, listening to really good sound Christian radio. There's a lot of junk on Christian radio. Turn that stuff off. And those thoughts going through your mind are like prompters, forcing you to dwell and think about the Lord and deepen and enlarge your love for Him, your appreciation of Him. And, and remember, there's... There's critical things with regard to the weightier matters of the law that we need daily reminder about because we are so prone to forget. Those, those precious reminders come as we, cause, we, we occupy our thoughts with the Word of God and the things of the Word and meditate on them. Very often when I listen to the Bible, my Bible reading tapes, because I'm on the road a lot, I, I visit the saints, I, I'm all over the Bay Area because we're a commuter church, and I visit you all over the place, and I'm listening to the Bible reading uh, tapes, and uh, Alexander Scorby was, was given a gift, was he not? Anyway, uh, I'm, I'm finding myself stopping the tape because a word or a sentence or a truth will hit me so hard, so hard. And it will, it will do what God intended meditation to do, to deepen the things of God. Because very often we, when we read or listen to the word, even a sermon like I'm preaching right now, most of us are so spiritually shallow, which we're just skimming the surface. We're not understanding how to listen to a sermon, how to listen to the reading of God's word. But when you, when, you, when you approach the Word of God properly with a clear conscience and you study and read it, that Word is going to penetrate. And, it, and that penetration will do what God intends for meditation to do. It will bring that truth deep within your being. It will fill out those empty spaces of your life and your heart. Are you following me? If you're bored, that's okay. You, you need to pray about it and ask God to give you understanding. You see, if you neglect the responsibility and habit of meditation on the things of God, you will lose, you will soon lose the frame and disposition of being spiritually minded. If you neglect meditation, you will lose the disposition of being spiritually minded. And other things will fill its place when, when the Word of God is no longer forefront on your mind through meditation. And what's worse is you'll become content with these other things that come in to take the place of the spiritual things. And then after that, if that keeps going, and if you keep going in that direction, you'll become blinded to the point where you'll, you'll think everything's okay when it's not okay with your life. That's why we read in 2 Peter chapter 1, turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. This is what the Word of God teaches us what happens when you, when you don't cause your minds to dwell daily and constantly on the Word of God? There's a battle. Something will occupy your thoughts because our minds are always going. Almost every second, right? We're thinking, right? 
There's not a second that goes by where we're not thinking about something, whether good or bad or neutral. Is there anything neutral? Usually there's nothing neutral. It's good or bad. If it's innocuous information, then that's okay. Maybe that's in the good side. A good, good category. Um, but we're always thinking about something. And so whoever has control of your heart and your mind has control of your thoughts. If you stop meditating on the Word of God, God's Word will lose control of your heart and mind and something else will gain control of it. Sports. Yesterday, I um, was talking with some of the brethren at the camp out. I'm not going to say who, but I had a couple of conversations where when I was done listening after about half hour, I knew, I knew the record of the 49ers. I knew college football left and right. I knew which teams were in first place, second place, third place. I knew the name of some of the quarterbacks. And, and I knew what their plans were after they finished the camp out to go home. And they were going to watch this game and that game and this game. And I knew a lot about college football and professional football. <laughs> we all struggle with this. I struggle. I battle in my thoughts to keep the world out, right? To keep the world out. Whatever, whatever has control of your mind and your heart has control of you. That's what you're going to be thinking about. That's what you're going to delight in. And that's what you're going to talk about. God is teaching us here through these texts how we are to think. You say, as a Christian, God, God gets, that, gets that deep in my life where he even tells me how to think? Yes, yes, because how you think, that's how you are. How I am. And we need to be careful how we are and how we speak and how we act and what we say. And the only way to control that is to get control of our thoughts. Because whoever has control of our thoughts will have control of our actions and our words and our thoughts about God and about people. Are you hearing me, brethren? You say, well, how dare you go this deep? in, in uh, seeking to control me. It's not me. Don't shoot the messenger. It's what the Bible teaches. For example, in 2 Peter, you say, well, you're so stirred up about it. Yeah, because I've had enough experiences where other things than Christ had temporary control of my mind as a Christian, and ultimately in my spirit, I knew something was wrong, and I didn't like where I was going in, in my thoughts and in my actions. The Spirit bearing witness with my spirit that I am to, I am to dedicate everything to Christ, including my thoughts, and beginning with my thoughts. Second Peter 1, 8 and 9. Second Peter 1, 8 and 9. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. This describes a Christian, especially if you read the context, who is supposed to manifest the fruits of the Spirit, but the lack of a consistent walk with God, reading the Word, meditating on the Word, a healthy prayer life, taking advantage of the means of grace and the services of the church, cause this person to grow weak and the things of God are no longer filling their, his, his or her mind. And they, they've absent, absent, absented themselves so often from being exposed to the means of grace. Verse 9 says that they even forgot that they were cleansed from their old sins. They were so blinded. That is the knowledge of truth, the thoughts of God, the thoughts of Scripture and the things of God had not gone through their minds for such a long period of time and quickened their spirit that they had little or no assurance and they forgot what it's like to experience the cleansing grace of the blood of Christ which always issues in fresh assurance and the fresh knowledge that our sins are forgiven that our sins are forgiven. It doesn't mean that we're getting saved all over again. But when we truly and daily repent and trust in the cleansing blood of Christ to sanctify us 
and wash us from the impurities of the world and remaining corruption. The spirit of adoption revives within our hearts and bears witness with me that not only am I his child, but he reminds me that all of my sins are forgiven, which produces joy in me. Amen? Amen. And, and these people who are not occupying their thoughts, their thoughts in the deepest recesses of our being are not forcing the word down into our thoughts. And that's what we have to do. We've got to force it down in there. Um, it says in what? Psalm 119 verse 11. Um, it, uh, Hide thy word in, my, in thy heart and I will not sin against you. Right? He desires truth in the inward parts, the innermost parts. We're to meditate on that truth when we walk by the way, when we lie down, when we rise up. Psalm 1 and Psalm 55 says, Getting that truth in the deepest recesses of our being and meditating on it, thinking about it, dwelling upon it, musing on it, which helps keep it down there, will of necessity keep the world out and the thoughts of Christ in. And we've got to force the truth constantly down in there because sometimes our minds dwell upon sinful things that, don't, that, that are in competition with the truth and even embarrass us when we think about the truth because we're shocked into the fresh realization that we've been dwelling for too long on the things of the world. In Hebrews 5, to the left, a couple of books to Hebrews 5, and in verse 12 we read, Hebrews 5, 12, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now a baby Christian is compared with a mature Christian here. Uh, and this text defines a, a mature Christian not as someone who's been in the faith for 20 or 30 or 40 years, but someone who has been using the Word of God, who by reason of use have their spiritual senses exercised. That is, they're getting the Word of God deep down inside of them every single day. That speeds up the Christian maturity process. There are some believers in this church who have been saved for two or plus years who are more mature than others who have been saved for 10, 15, 20. I'm talking about in our experience, not necessarily in our head knowledge, our knowledge of the Word of God. In the previous text we look at, we looked at in 2 Peter 1, 8 and 9, the lack of a regular practice of meditating on the Word of God causes us to forget critical things that, that are essential to our joy and our assurance in the faith. In this passage, the lack of assimilating and reading and meditating upon the Word of God regularly causes a believer to revert back to a state of babyhood, inexperience. There are some of us who have the equivalent of a PhD in theology, but are spiritual babies in our experience. But meditation, godly, divine meditation on the Word of God, will reverse these two very bad effects of neglecting the Word of God as the fountain and source of our daily meditation, which is the basis of preserving and sustaining spiritual mindedness. Daily meditation is the basis of preserving and sustaining spiritual mindedness. And, and daily meditation can reverse the seeds or the far advanced cancer of forgetfulness and of Christian babyhood. The third and last passage I want to show you, direct you to, one book uh, to the right, the book of James. <clears throat> In the book of James chapter 1, we have a third text which discloses what happens when we stop meditating on the Word. We cease being spiritually minded because we've forsaken a daily ministry of meditating on the Word of God. 
James 1 and verse 22. James 1 and verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks or continues to look into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So if you continue to look into the word, that is, keep it before your mind's eye. Meditate on it day in and day out. Don't just read a verse or two or a chapter even to salve your conscience. That's approaching your meditation and reading of the word with the wrong attitude, the wrong motive, and the wrong goal. I'm, I'm going to read the word so my conscience is clear today. No, that's not why we read the Bible. I read the word, you read the word, we should read the word because we want to become more like Christ. We want to think his thoughts after him. We want him and his truth and his doctrine to fill our whole inner man so that we can be like him, think like him, talk like him, act like him because that's our highest privilege and purpose for being created and being saved is to be like Jesus Christ, to be transformed into his image. And the closer we get to that goal every day, the more joy and fulfillment and happiness we have in the innermost part of our being. And so with those six cautions and guidelines, let's move in the remaining minutes to the third point on cultivating cultivating spiritual mindedness, mindedness, which is how to think spiritually about Christ. How to think spiritually about Christ. This is a responsibility that requires commitment. <clears throat> Deliberate, intentional, proactive efforts. We don't just come to church, hear about these things, go home, and Sunday night, you know, that was, that, that, that's true. I haven't heard that from a, for a long time. And we don't think about it anymore. It's more than thinking about it. I'm not here, I'm not a one-man band where I'm, I'm you know, I want to I have people say, you know, you really played a good, a good flute, but nobody does anything about what we're talking about. The Word of God has to be heard and applied and lived out properly. That's why God said, take heed how you hear. This is not a concert. When the Word of God is opened and preached and taught, we immediately are, it's incumbent upon us to do it, to take it home and grapple with it and wrestle with it and somehow, some way, by God's grace, apply it, pray about it, bring it before God, even with the weakest faith and say, God, this is where I live, this is my need, this is what I must do. This is what I've struggled with for months and years and I'm still not where I want to be. Help me because I'm accountable now. I've got to do it. Help me apply this day in and day out to my life. Amen. And so then, we need to think a certain way, the Bible teaches, about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm sure most of you have had contact with unsaved people who have all kinds of opinions and thoughts about Jesus, who he is, what his mission was, what his teachings mean. And you've gotten all different kinds of teachings, but the Bible says in Corinthians that there's another Jesus, another spirit out there, and it's not the Jesus and the spirit of the Bible, another gospel. We've got to think a certain way about Jesus Christ. And he tells us in the Bible how to think about him. And when we think about him that way or get close to it, wonder of wonders, the Spirit of God comes alongside of us and helps us, helps us think. He deepens the thoughts of Christ in our minds and hearts. He declares Jesus Christ. He, he teaches. He's the teacher. The Holy Spirit is the teacher, right? The comforter, the teacher. He will teach you all things. And he will, he will adjust our thinking where it may go off here and there. Especially if we begin meditation with, with a clear conscience. The Spirit of God will have the freedom not being hindered by sin or unconfessed sin. Or grieved away by unconfessed sin. He'll, he'll have more freedom to come in 
and adjust and reset our thinking about the Lord Jesus Christ to make sure it's accurate, it's biblical, and it's wonderful, wonderful. Oh, we're talking about the, the minutia of the Christian faith. This is where we live. This is where we Christians, true Christians, live. And, and all of these principles are regulated and circumscribed by doctrine. By doctrine. So that we know when we're getting off here, off to the left or to the right, the scripture, the scripture brings us back onto the right path, the narrow path which leads to life. Well, when we talk about thinking spiritually about Christ, first of all, in the first place, it is an immeasurable privilege to constantly occupy our thoughts with Jesus Christ and his glory. The privilege we're given to, to occupy our minds for our whole life predominantly with the glory and person and work and the character of Jesus Christ is an immeasurable, it's an unspeakable, it's an undefinable privilege. It's an honor to have this little tiny brain, this speck in, of a brain in this speck of a body compared to all the universe. And God has given us the gifts unlike no other creature to do justice to some extent to the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. And he views these little puny thoughts which issue from a sanctified spirit and brain as an act of worship, a sweet smelling savor in his nostrils. And he gave us intelligence and reason and imagination and every other intellectual and spiritual cognitive ability to do honor and justice to the Lamb of God in our thought life as we simply meditate on him according to the principles of God's word. Oh, I need to roll up my sleeves, brethren, and get down to business with the rest of my life. In, in this duty of, of holy meditation and cultivating spiritual thoughts about Christ because it's honoring to Christ. It's, it's glorious. Amen. And this will be the eternal focus and occupation of the thoughts and minds of the saints in heaven forever. Your brain and however changed that brain will be, you will be probably much more uh, greatly outfitted with the capacity to understand in, intelligently things about God that you and I understand now. But when you add to that the devotional component of cognitive worship, of recognizing and acknowledging who Christ is and giving Him the glory, when you add the devotional, the spiritual component to that, where we now are, are, are equipped with the gift and the ability to respond to what our sanctified minds uh, remind us or teach us about the resurrected Christ, the glorified Christ. We're able to respond with worship, with praise. Not only does, does the Lord accept truthful and accurate thoughts as an act of worship, as the Holy Spirit guides them according to His Word, but our hearts respond with love, with thanks, with praise, which also is accepted as an act of worship by him. This is our eternal, this will be our eternal occupation. We read about this in Revelation 7. Look at what the saints are doing. You tell me what they're doing here in Revelation 7. And in beginning at verse 9. Look at this scene, the glorified saints here. Look at what they're doing. Look at what their minds are occupied with. They're not sitting, sitting up in their mansion in heaven playing Monopoly. Look at what they're doing here in verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, that's the righteousness of Christ, with palm branches in their hands. We all agree these are, these are all the saints together, standing before Christ, of every tribe, every generation. What are they doing? Verse 10, and crying out with a loud voice. Not, not like some of us sing the hymns or we mumble. But these saints are crying out with a loud voice. Not a, not a whisper, a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. 
Why? Why do they cry out like that? Because their minds have been occupied with the truth, which drove them to praise with their hearts and their lips. Drove them to praise the Lamb of God. Verse 11, all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped the Lamb. In response to what the saints praised the Lamb about, here are these other, these other groups, the elders, the, the, uh, the four living creatures and the angels, they fell down and worshiped saying, Amen. They said Amen to what the saints said. <laughs> this was a cognitive truth that they had mused upon. I don't know how long did all, the, all of us, and we're in that number, mused upon the fact that here is the Lamb of God in all of His glory. And like you see heat on an extremely hot day, waves of heat lifting up and emanating from the ground, in a similar manner, perhaps, we will see waves of the truth and glory of Christ emanating from the throne. And that truth will come into our minds and will remind us of the full orb, character and attributes and perfections of the Lamb of God. So occupied in their minds with this truth, they praise the Lord. And it caused everyone around the saints to fall down and say, Amen. Nobody can praise the Lord like the saints can praise the Lord. Blessing and honor and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and glory, power and might be to our God forever and ever. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? These saints, all arrayed in white robes. And I said to him, sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. What's that? What's, what are we going to be occupied with? We are before the throne of God day and night. We don't leave. We're before that throne day and night, the saints. And we serve him day and night in his temple. Whatever that means, I know there's much symbolism and types and figures in Revelation. But I think this is pretty simple when we look at hermeneutics. And the plain meaning here is that we will be occupied in our minds, our thoughts, our affections, day and night, night and day. All day, every day, forever and ever, with serving the Lord Jesus Christ, worshiping Him, communicating with Him. Our thoughts will be riveted upon Him. Our thoughts will be completely and forever immersed with the truth and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Never again to be distracted by some worldly thing. The 49ers. This thing, that thing, the other thing which compared with this is infinitely inferior for us to, to, to occupy the sacred, sanctified thought life of a believer with vanity. I know some, some people are going to call me a legalist. They're going to try to find wiggle room and, and ascribe some of these things that we really shouldn't be focused on 99% of the time or 90% of the time. And, and, and say, you don't believe in Christian liberty. I do. But what is liberty? And what things can we, can we uh, what do we define as liberty? So, I don't know about you, but I look forward to joining this company. But we won't enjoy being with him there if we don't enjoy being with him here. Right? I know some people who get, who, can, who, who get very concerned if too long a time passes without Christ occupying their thoughts. Are you among them? A couple days go by and 
I don't know, sometimes it happens, we get swept up with work and the boss wants us to work a 12 hour day and we go home just enough time to sleep, grab something, we're off again, school or whatever it is, and, and lo and behold, after two, three, four days, we find that we haven't read the Bible and we haven't thought about the Lord. And if, if you're like me, I'm shocked. For a second, my breath is taken away. How did that happen, Lord? What just happened? Well, that's a good sign. That's a good sign. It means that the Lord is in you. And when there's a temporary lapse in communion and dwelling upon Him, meditating on Him, we're shocked into the realization that, that something took our, our thoughts off of the things of the Lord. That's why it's important that we not overcommit to work or any other thing, whether it's a le legitimate pursuit, a, what, something of Christian liberty, Something that may build us up intellectually and, you know, make us more better citizens or whatever it is. We need to be in control of our time so we can devote our thoughts. We can have the time to, to walk with the Lord in His Word and think His thoughts after Him. Sadly, I know others who rarely, if ever, have Jesus Christ in their thoughts. But let me ask you, will you pray and ask the Lord Jesus to take complete control of your thought life today and ask you uh, and ask him for grace to reverse habits and practices that are getting your mind constantly on the broad road which leads to destruction? Will you ask him to do that right now? Right now, if he's speaking to you now, ask him to do that now. Secondly, it's important to think about Christ in a biblical way. In a biblical way. Nothing in the scripture suggests that we need a crucifix hanging around our neck to remind us to think about Jesus. Or we need to make a pilgrimage to a certain location to remind us to meditate upon him. If we have the spirit of God in us, the spirit of God is an expert, even when we're weak and backslidden, at bringing up the thoughts of God and of Christ into our minds. But God has designed certain means that act as both an injector and a trigger to fill our thoughts with Christ. And when we use these means diligently, you will find yourself constantly, constantly, even during your earthly duties, <coughs> thinking about the Lord and walking with the Lord and praising the Lord. What are some of the means of grace that he uses? The systematic reading of the Bible. The systematic reading of the Bible. I don't like to follow Bible reading plans because they lock you in. Sometimes you feel, okay, I've read the three chapters today. I want to read more, but if I read more, I'll be into tomorrow's reading. It seems like a... Well, yeah, let's read tomorrow's reading. Let's keep reading if that's where... Sometimes they're good because some of us can only take so much, maybe a half a chapter, and they kind of put a, push us to come up to the three chapters a day. That's good. There are, there are pros and cons. But remember, it's, it's, it's only a tool. But we need to read systematically every day the Word of God. And our attitude in reading is, remember, not to salve our conscience, but to find Christ. To find Christ. Secondly, the second means of grace to, to, so that we can cultivate spiritual thinking is the daily reading of the scriptures, not just systematically every day going through a book in the Bible, but daily, reading daily. The Bible actually defines the frequency. Meditate on the Lord when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. That's throughout the day, as much as you possibly can daily. So read the Bible daily. If you read the Bible once a week, shame on you. Shame on me. What are we doing? Number three, the meditation of the scriptures. When you read, remember, it's not how much you read. You don't get credit with God for reading five chapters and you were like speed reading it and nothing stuck to you. Like the flash. No. If you, you could read three verses and get much more out of it and be blessed and edified and fed and built up and sanctified. If you read and you meditate on those three verses rather than reading ten chapters and your head is spinning at the end because you sp speed read them and you have no idea what you read. Number four, 
the illumination and revelation of the Holy Spirit. You need to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate, to reveal the spiritual meaning of what you're reading. And you need grace, and I need grace to apply it to my life. The Holy Spirit is indispensable in doing this vital function for us. <clears throat> Number five, pray for the Spirit's help. Confess to the Holy Spirit. You'll be reading the Bible like a newspaper or a novel or like the Pharisees read the Bible. You won't penetrate the surface. You won't be able to apply it unless he helps you. You need the Spirit's help. Number six, the public preaching and teaching of the Scriptures. If you come to church once a month, you're going to lack, seriously lack, in, in uh, having thoughts and areas of emptiness in your life that need to be filled out, that only the preaching, this public and systematic preaching and teaching of God's Word will help you to do. It's a means of grace. It's a means of supplying deep and broad thoughts to think about during the week. I have people come to me, brethren, sisters, sometimes to say, you know, Pastor, it's, they'll call me on a Friday and Saturday and they'll talk about a sermon two weeks ago or last week and they have a question about it or they're thinking about it. It's the Holy Spirit who helps us hold on to a truth and bring it deep within our hearts through the preaching and teaching of the scriptures. Some, some brethren can't, get, can't uh, get enough uh, from just the Sunday uh, ministry. They're, they're listening to sermon audio, all these other preachers. They're listening to tapes and CDs of MacArthur and all these other good men. Wonderful, wonderful. Keep it up. The Holy Spirit will deepen your appetite for more of the word the more you meditate on it. Number, si uh, number seven, spiritual communion and fellowship with the saints. Develop the skill and art of bringing out the most edifying stuff from your brothers and sisters in the church that the Lord has shown them, revealed to them, blessed them with. That will edify you. That means you've got to be prepared to talk about spiritual things. Go to a brother and a sister, not in a legalistic, condemnatory way, but ask questions. Start off, well, what do you, uh, what do you love most about Jesus? How's that for a starter? <laughs> and just let, it, let that brother or sister go and, and be quickened by the response. Have, have, uh, be open and receptive to what that brother or sister will say. And number eight. Faithfully attend the worship services, the communion service, the prayer meetings, and the Bible studies. Plug in to every outlet that this church offers you as a member to come under the teaching of the word, the ministry of the saints, the exercise of all the gifts of all the believers as connected with the word, which will, will, will be spiritual prompters to feed your mind, to deepen your Opportunities to meditate on the Word of God so that you can preserve a, a spiritual mindedness. I'm not going to go to my third point, God willing, that'll be for next time. We see how deep and serious and committed uh, we must be, and this, this responsibility is in cultivating spiritual mindedness and meditating on the Word of God. You see how important this is. You say, Well, Pastor Joe, I've been encouraged in the last several messages on this. What do I do from here? Where do I? Well, look, if you know you've been struggling and you look at your schedule, you look at your daily routine, and it's just a jumble. It, there's nothing planned, nothing orderly, very little organization. Start by organizing your daily schedule and make the reading and study and meditation of the scriptures a number one priority. More than work? More than work! You say, but I have to be to work at 8 o'clock, and I get up at 7, and by the time I, I, I get cleaned up, and I eat breakfast, and I drive there, I'm out the door, I only have five minutes left to read and pray, and that's not enough. Let me give you a, a, a brilliant uh, suggestion. I, I should be a genius for thinking this. Get up at 6 o'clock. Don't get up at 7 o'clock. And spend a whole hour should I even suggest that without, get, without being, uh, getting pelted with tomatoes? A whole hour with the Lord in the Word. I'll tell you, by the end of that hour, when I do that, there has never been a time when I have not gotten at least a crumb or a little nugget of Christ that has warmed my heart, 
that has lasted the whole day. Oh, and it, the treasure is here, and it's waiting to be mined and exhumed. Here it is. And many have died to give us this Bible. Amen. And we have the completed word. The scriptures are sufficient for every aspect of faith and practice. All the doctrines are laid out, and Christ is in every doctrine, waiting to be pulled out of those doctrines and applied to my life so I can adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And we pray as we are challenged by your word to go deeper in our responsibility to meditate on the word day and night, we pray that beginning tonight, even tomorrow morning, that you would open up our eyes, that we would behold wondrous things out of your law. That you would help us to, to pull this truth down deep in our inward parts. And, and help us develop habits of lifestyle and routine that we would perpetuate day in and day out. The reading and study of your word, the memorization of it, the meditation on it that we would sustain layers and layers of the thoughts of Christ in our inner and outer man so that the thoughts of the world and the enemy and the flesh have very little room to squeeze in and unravel the, these layers of truth that we meditate on day and night. Father, be with us. Help us to be a disciplined church as we as we. Go forward in these last days, getting closer to that time that we will be among the saints in Revelation 7 of all nations, kindred, tongues, worshiping, praising, perpetually, uninterrupted with the thoughts and the mind of Christ. Oh, what an honor, what a privilege this is that we have this stewardship now to begin to develop and, and, and deepen uh, the thoughts of Christ now by, by protecting and guarding jealously our our, our minds, our motives, our goals, our time every day. Oh Lord, please, please help us in these things. For we're weak, we often forget, we, we, we're unfaithful. We need you to be our strength from day to day. We love you and we praise you for giving us your word and this supreme privilege of being your saints, your children. Help us, oh God, to walk worthy of this vocation wherewith we are called, and we will be careful to praise you and thank you even forever. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.